All right. Welcome back, everyone. This is B-Sides Las Vegas 2019, day two. Uh, the name of this talk is Old Things Are New Again, presented by Hiram Anderson. And before we begin, we just have a few quick announcements. Uh, first off, we'd like to thank our sponsors, especially our Inner Circle sponsors, Critical Stack, and Veil Mail, as well as our stellar sponsors, Amazon, Microsoft, and Paranoids. It's support from these sponsors, as long, as, along with our other sponsors, donors, and volunteers that make this event possible. Now, this talk is being live streamed, so we ask that as a courtesy to our speaker and to the audience that you right now make sure to check that your phone is set on silent. Uh, also, if you have any questions, uh, please use this audience mic so that our YouTube audience can hear you. Just raise your hands and I'll be sure to bring that mic over. And with that, we're ready to begin. So please, let's welcome Hiram Anderson. Thank you for the introduction. I'm uh, delighted to be back at B-Sides Ground Truth. Um, so my name is Hiram Anderson, and I'm the chief scientist at an endpoint security company called Endgame. And my secondary objective today is to um, be on somewhat of an apology tour for signatures. I spent the first <laughs> first uh, five years of my career dissing them. And uh, my, my primary objective actually is, is to get you to lunch. So I'll, be, uh, I'll try to be brief in my remarks today and probably just uh, hope to pique your interest and hopefully that you and I can chat during, during lunch in more detail or you can find me at the end game booth at, at B-Sides. So I think it's fair to say that one thing that machine learning has done really well in security is, uh, is malware. So we're gonna talk about mal malware today. And particularly, it's good at detecting malware before it ex executes with a low false positive rate. So um, the reason it's sort of taken fire, I think the primary reason is because um, you can detect new samples, not before seen, at a modest false positive rate. And that's the primary driver for the success of, of machine learning for static malware detection. Um, I, I think today any serious um, endpoint security company has to say the words machine learning when they talk about their anti-malware <laughs> solution um, because of this fact, because um, it doesn't just memorize the past, but it also projects a little bit into the future. One important element I think that is not often stated about what machine learning has done to our industry, particularly for malware, is it actually has brought about a paradigm shift. What I mean by that is in the old days, you had, um, cubicles of malware experts writing signatures. And today, you have a data set and um, somebody just turning the crank who doesn't have to know hardly anything about malware in order to produce a new model. So the automation component of that is, is actually a huge benefit to, to modern anti-malware products. Um, and in fact, um, this, you know, this, this hand cranking part is, is so easy that um, you don't really have to know much about malware. Even a data scientist can do it. Right? So now contrast that with the quote unquote old school way of signatures um, on this side. Um, um, so signatures do not generalize to the future. They're terrible at predicting new families and, and new, but, but you know what they do well? They do exactly what you told them to do. They are excellent at, at capturing the known malware at almost a 0% false positive rate. And in fact, that is better in most cases, it, in most cases than machine learning. So what I want to just um, start off with this exercise is understanding the strengths and the weaknesses of these two things. So, uh, but let me go back, that was a mistake. So um, with, with signatures, I can get 100% true positive rate and almost 0% false positive rate. And in fact, um, that, that does require usually domain expertise and some sort of manual intervention. But at the end of the day, when you're finished, this signature is totally interpretable in a way that machine learning isn't quite yet. What I mean by that is, um, so what, what do I mean by interpretable? So here's a, here's a rule. There's a Yara, a, a Yara signature that detects Locker Goga, and it was written by Florian Roth. And if you ignore almost everything except this bottom condition, which I've highlighted, you know exactly why malware is being called Locker Goga. It happens exactly for two conditions. There's an or right here. Either it has a PE header, so this is, this is MZ, 
and its file size is less than four megabytes, and it has one of these strings, one of these um, five strings that begin with an X, or it contains this, this wide uh, string. This may lead to the impossibility of recovery of certain files. So this is a signature. It's, it's imperfect because by changing just a few things, I can break the signature, but it exactly captures all of the locker Goga samples already released in the wild. And you know exactly what it's doing. So where we want to live is actually in the sweet spot in this middle. So we're going to let machine learning do its thing on the unseen stuff. But we also want to get away from the old way of the scaling problem, the human scaling problem. We want to have the automation of machine learning where I just point algorithms at data and outcome signatures for all of the known bad samples. Um, these rules are, are perfectly interpretable. You know exactly what it's doing. Um, and um, it doesn't require, you know, I can turn the, even a data scientist can do this. He can turn the crank and make these, these signatures without sort of understanding um, totally what, what's happening. Um, of course, we will never have uh, good true positive rates on new, new samples and new families. That is the role for machine learning. So the goal is to use these two things together instead of uh, these two things together. So I'll be talking about, and, and for our YouTube audience, that these things, you can't see my laser pointer, we want to use our, our automatic signature ge generation to uh, bring the best of automation with um, uh, low false positive rates. So I just want to clearly point out that this desire to live in this sweet spot middle is not at all a new desire or a new thing. Um, there's, there's several uh, excellent approaches, solutions out there already. I, I'm going to just name three. Um, the first is by Florian Roth called Yargen. And it's, it was actually not intended to be totally automatic. It's a semi-automated thing. So you point Yargen at a batch of samples, and it will create candidate YAR rules that you should review by hand and tweak until it, it works right for you. Um, so it, it's meant to be refined by a human. The other two in the middle, VXSIG and, and BASE, these are actually uh, very, they're, they're based on the same work. Uh, VXSIG was recently uh, announced, released by Google, uh, Hover Flake tweeted about it, that um, it's essentially, and BASE both, they're, they're both based on Christian Bleichmann's um, 2008 thesis. Essentially, it takes IDA Pro disassembly and uses a least common subsequence algorithm to find signatures that describe um, opcode sequences for, for malware families. So um, for, for today, I'm going to be talking about more of the first thing. We don't want to have a re any reliance on any of this assembler. We want to just use the raw byte strings um, for this work. So um, I, in my education, I was taught that, and I believe that a talk is an advertisement for a paper. So here's a paper which was presented uh, just on Monday at KDD workshop on, for cybersecurity in, in Alaska, and, and now today at B-Sides. So you'll note that. Um, on the author list, I'm, I'm way down here. I, I do want to call out that uh, my uh, really smart colleagues from the Laboratory of Physical Sciences and, and UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, who have, have uh, done far more work on this than I have. Um, but please, it, it, you, you can find this paper today on Archive, and it'll give a much more thorough explanation than I will today. So let's talk about engrams real quick. Um, engrams have been the bread and butter for a whole host of machine learning applications, ranging from natural language processing, bioinformatics, uh, and of course, uh, even to malware. Um, so in particular, an engram is, is a way to, to splice up a long string into in little tokens, and the number of tokens included is, is the number n. So a unigram is for this is a sentence would be each of the words individually. A bigram or two grams would be this is, is a, a sentence, and so on. Uh, trigrams uh, using three, uh, three tokens in that, um, in that three gram. So um, for, for uh, malware, um, ingrams have been used on uh, tokens that represents raw bytes. And that's what we're going to talk most about today. But all of the same techniques I'm discussing today could also be used, for example, in disassembly mnemonics or Windows API function call sequences or um, Windows security event sequences. And all these, these same things apply, but we're going to focus on the raw bytes for today. So now, now what makes uh, malware raw bytes really interesting to me and unique when compared to most of these other uh, machine learning natural language process domains are really two things. The first is the sequence length. So if you think about a, a document for natural language processing, if you have 10,000 words in your document, that's a giant document for natural language processing. But for malware, to have 1, 000, 1 million bytes is actually kind of average. So the, the, just the length of documents and tokens is different. 
that so it, it makes you wonder if the engrams that we developed for document parsing are maybe not totally well suited for malware parsing, where document length is so much different. A second thing is that I find interesting is um, is just the the size of the engrams. So. Um, for most of machine learning uh, in natural language processing and compression and speech, um, it's most common to use unigrams or bigrams or trigrams, but almost never do you see n equal to four or more. And in malware, there's been a few efforts to have n equal to six, but almost nothing has exceeded that. And that's, that's interesting for a number of reasons, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring up that. So the first is the, the sheer vocabulary size. So we're talking about byte sequences, the number of byte sequences of total possible byte sequences for six grams is something like um, 280 trillion. That's, that's a total number of possible combinations you could get, right? Um, in, in order for me to extract six grams on five terabytes of data, we, we did this, and it took a 12 machine cluster one month to find the six grams. So um, 256 to the n is painful, and we can barely do six. And at the same time, if you think about malware, you almost think like six. Is six really enough if you want a gram to mean anything at all? So with, with six bytes, I can capture three wide characters, right? I can get the MIC of Microsoft, and that's it. With n equals six, I can't even capture the full x86 instruction set, which can go up to 15 bytes. So it makes you wonder, like, are we, have, are we doing it wrong? Like, if I want a gram to mean something, am I doing it wrong? So the question we asked ourselves was kind of a crazy idea. What if, what if there was a world in which we can extract a 256 gram, or a 512 gram, or a 1024 gram? Spoiler, 1024 gram, we're gonna call it kilogram. Do you get it? Okay, so if that were possible, would that even be useful? Intuitively, the data scientists and you and me are thinking, that's a terrible idea. You're overfitting to maybe a single sample, and it'll never be useful. But spoiler alert, it turns out that signatures work in malware. And people reuse very long strings of bytes across a malware family. And we'll see that later. OK, so um, were it possible, we would like to explore whether or not we should even consider n-grams bigger than 6, which has never been done before. And we're going we're gonna to approach it in the following way. So there, there is a hope. Um, and it, they're based on sort of two observations. The first is that n-grams follow this power law. The power law means that there's a few six grams that are used everywhere, but the proportionality drops off according to this linear power rate, right? So um, most n-grams are used in only a few samples, and there's a few dominant ones. The second observation is that for writing signatures for malware, we actually only care about the dominant ones. If I want to write a signature for Locker Goga, I want my ingram to cover all of the Locker Goga samples, right? If I'm, so, so I can throw away all the other ingrams. So think about that 256 to the n space. We only care about just a tiny, a tiny pinpoint in that space. That pinpoint representing the very top of this power law distribution, right? OK, so given those two observations, let's sketch a solution. The first is that we're just going to focus on the top k. Let's call k a million, right? A million out of 280 trillion. It's a pin drop. But a million is still a lot of, a lot of grams to worry about. And we're going we're gonna to do an algorithm that, that does two passes in a very efficient way. The first pass, we're just going to find what are candidates for k. We'll use a hash table for that. Hash tables have collisions. We'll deal with it. And in a second pass, we'll use that hash table as a filter to only um, extract um, the candidate k values and actually retain the actual n-grams. And let me actually do this like three times, so um, it'll be very clear how, how simple this is. And I'm not going to show this today in the talk, but if you, if you care about such things and want to read the paper, um, because of the power law behavior and because we only care about the top k, uh, we can actually bound the error rate in recovering the true top k tokens in the presence of these hash table collisions, right? So uh, we can say that with certainty, we are actually giving you the real top k uh, of, of uh, the ingrams. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me just walk through it with a very fancy simulation what this algorithm looks like. So the, the, blue, the blue thing is my hash table. And um, think of this hash table as having like, um, it's like 16 gigabytes, right? It can fit on your laptop, in laptop memory. 
Um, and then I have a, bunch, a batch of files on disk. And for the sake of this demonstration, we're going to say there, there are three grams in my set of files. And I have a hash function. And the hash function um, is this compute a location for this gram. So remember, this is a sentence. This would get a location to look up in my hash table. So gram one says, I'm going to increment. I'm going to go to that location, the hash table, and increment. Gram two says, OK, you belong here. And let's say uh, gram three is a collision. And I, I go back to that, uh, that location, the hash table. I've just showed you the first pass of the kilograms algorithm. I just count things in a hash table, and I throw away all the grams. So think about 234 billion things. I can't possibly keep around 234 billion six grams in memory or disk. But I can keep around the 16 gigabyte hash table with counts in it. So uh, the second pass, I'm now just going to use this hash table as a filter. And now, every time I come around, I, I pass through one of these grams again, gram one, I see that he belonged to one of the dominant buckets. And so I'll keep that gram. I'll keep the actual six characters and store him to some data structure or database. Gram two did not meet the threshold, and I discard him. And that will be the case for the majority of grams I encounter. And, and then gram three, this collision, I'll keep him too. And guess what? That collision, I've recorded that, and I've recorded their counts in this new data structure, and I can tell them apart now. Even though their hash, hashes were the same, I have the original byte sequences back. OK, so um, that was, that was uh, the second description of the algorithm. The last time, I'm going to show you uh, 34 lines of Python code that will allow you to implement this on your own. OK, so it, it, you can't read this because it's too small. Uh, but if you zoom in on your camera phone, maybe you can do it. But, uh, there's four parts. I create a hash table that's a numpy array. All right. Then I do a map reduce to, to accumulate things into this hash table. And to make this fast, you can use clever hashing tricks like um, a rolling hash algorithm, like the, the ribbon carp hash. Then there's a third part where I do a, a NP partition, a numpy partition sort to find out which, which are the dominant k counts in my hash table. And then, then the, the last part is pass two, where I use that hash table as a filter, and I store my true ingrams and guess what? A Python dict. OK, that's my fancy, that, that's my fancy space saving structure. Super easy, OK? So let's, let's look at this now. Um, let's look at some, some experiments that I hope you'll find interesting. On, uh, now that we can compute ingrams of ludicrous size, like 1,024, are they at all useful? So first, I want to tell you about some data sets. We have four of them we tried against. One was an industry, so provided by a, an industry partner um, that contained two, two million and change uh, portable XPU files from 2014 and 15. The year is important, as I'll, I'll mention later. Then we're going to use the Ember uh, PEs from 2017. We have a malicious. Um, uh, uh, sorry, a PDF data set, and also we have s some virus share. So the virus share set is just malware families. The top 20 windows malware families where the family is given by AV class. And we're going to run the follow, following experiments across them. The first is, um, like, how large is N? How large should N be? I mean, our data science intuition says that you're, you're silly to choose a large N because you'll be overfitting. So what we did is we, uh, we took the top 100,000 ingrams across each of these data set corpi, and we, um, we built an elastic net model. And um, we tried all these values of n ranging from n equals 8 to n equals 1,024. And so the first thing is your intuition of mine was correct, is that as you increase n, your performance drops. So the graph that I'm showing here is um, it's a balanced accuracy. Each of these data sets have different data set sizes. So I'm uh, weighting them and aggregating them in a balanced way into this accuracy number. And the reason accuracy instead of another metric is because one of these has no benign in it, right? So accuracy is a way to wrap them all together. So what you should notice is that as I increase n, that my performance drops from close to 100% to down near you know, 75% or something, balanced accuracy. That's intuitive. One thing I found really surprising is that n equals 32, which is a ludicrously large n-gram size for most things, is really no worse than n equals 8. That was kind of interesting. Totally unexpected and surprising is that when we went to n equals 1024, this worked at all. 
So in fact, um, if you'll notice the accuracy numbers for n, equal, uh, n equals 1024 on the bottom, we're getting something like 92% accuracy um, on many of the data sets. The other very unexpected thing is, you know, you and I have been taught since our childhood that signatures are brittle and they'll only last so long. But in fact, uh, this last column here is, um, this says end to ember, is when we extracted these signatures on the 2014, 2015 data, and then we applied them to the 2017 data. And that's the accuracy number we're reporting. So if you look, the accuracies are in the high 90s for the, for the, you know, the not as ludicrously large in grams, and actually 72% for the 1,024 grams. So that's kind of interesting. Um, what we did with this was the following. So the intuition should be, if I use n equals 1,024, I'm gonna have low recall, but extremely high precision, right? There's gonna be only a few samples that match this very specific byte string, right? So we're gonna form the following algorithm this way. The algorithm is we're gonna create a Yara rule by using these ludicrously large n-grams, these kilograms, and we're gonna start with the extremely high precision low recall side, and um, until we have enough coverage, we'll just decrease in until we have covered our family enough. Does that make sense? So um, in, in words, we start with n equals 1024, and we have a little while loop that while it's bigger, while n is bigger than 64, then, then extract signatures, make sure they don't exist in another family or a benign set, and, um, and then do a very fancy or statement. So I'm just gonna or all these if it exists, if this string exists, or this string, or this string. That's my YAR rule, okay? And until I've met my target coverage. So this really simple thing, this really simple algorithm, which is a few lines of code, um, if I compare this to YARGIN, and I, I will caveat um, to, to Florian Roth that this was never meant to be fully automated, and this is exactly what we did, we fully automated it. But um, compared to fully automated YARGIN, um, kilograms outperforms it across the board on this, this set of, uh, of 20, um, 20 malware families. There are a few malware families which uh, they all failed spectacularly at, but for the most part, we, we have a very high um, F1 scores. Okay, so why else would you want really large ingrams? Well, if they're really large, you know exactly what they're doing. Right? And I want to just uh, take you through a tour of some of the engrams that were discovered in, these, in these malware, th th this malware corpus that I think is really interesting. So first, um, so what engrams are more, the more common in malicious binaries than benign? So here's one. This is a, gr a gram that was discovered. It is a registry key, and you'll recognize it as a common registry used for run key persistent. And guess what? A lot of malware tries to persist using this run key. And I, knowing nothing about um, the malware behavior, um, only that this existed in 12% of all malicious files in Ember, this, this uh, signature was discovered totally automatically, required no, no brains, no, no security brains, right? Here's another interesting one. Um, this one did require brains, um, not mine, to understand what it did. So we found, um, I think this was a 64 gram, maybe 128 gram we found a byte sequence that was very common in malware, and I handed it over to my friend Bill, and I said, Bill, what is this? And he, he, uh, he uh, disassembled it, and he, he told me, he said, look, look at these bytes, that's virtual outlook, right? So this is, this is assembling a string in uh, machine code for virtual outlook that is used later to go get, get proc adder so that I can load dynamically DLLs in order to evade static machine learning detection. So this is really cool because this was an 8% of malicious binaries and kilograms just found it. I wasn't looking for it, it just found it, right? That's pretty cool. Okay, um, this is from the PDF data set. This is from a 512 gram. It picked up, uh, turns out that malware authors are lazy, just like you and I, and they reuse the code. And here is an obfuscated JavaScript string used to exploit a particular version of PDF reader. And I honestly have no idea what it does, but it's used all over. And um, this exact string you can find in hundreds and hundreds of malicious samples of PDF. And Kilograms just found it because it was popular. And that's it, this is, a, this is a cool signature. 
Okay, last, last deep dive into signatures. This one's also kind of fun. So there was, a, there was another signature used um, all over in thousands of malicious binaries in the Ember data set. And I give it to Bill, and he, he tried to disassemble it, and it wouldn't. And finally he said, well, where did this signature happen? And it turned out it lit up everywhere in all the resource sections. So we went to the resource sections, and it turns out this icon, this icon is used everywhere. If you see this icon on your desk, do not click. <laughs> okay? So this, um, this is a totally brittle signature. I could change a pixel here, and this signature would fail. But guess what? Malware authors are totally lazy, and they are reusing this icon all over the place, right? Okay, I'm done. I've, I, I already I, I promised you that my first objective was to get you to lunch on time. And if you will, um, if you'd like to chat more later, please do. I have lots more slides that show uh, caveats and, and more interesting findings. But I would just provide a summary. So I, I talked to you about kilograms, which is a clever play on words that I didn't think of, and I wish I did. But it's as simple and it's insanely efficient. Remember how it took me a month of a 12 cluster machine to extract six grams? With this kilogram, so the, the secrets to kilograms, I use this streaming hash algorithm and a hash table. That's it, and, and 43 lines of code, right? And I can, in, I can extract one million samples on my laptop in, in less than a day, right? So it's, it's pretty efficient. And it's actually surprisingly good and interp interpretable. We saw that um, you know it's not going to beat machine learning ever on never before seen samples, but for some malware, malware families, it has 100% detection and 0% false positive rates. So this is something you'd want to use in addition to your machine learning um, for the known stuff, the known bad, right? And, and that's that's my final point. I guess, I guess the, the the overall picture here uh, in my apology tour is that um, signatures are terrible for detecting new things, but they are awesome for detecting the things that you know are there, are already out there, and maybe you should use them. Thank you. So we have time for about two, three questions. The more questions, the less lunch, just so you know. <laughs> Do you see the uh, antivirus machine learning industry start focusing on classifying the non-kilogram classifiable malware then, like specifying those, or? Well, I will, I will say that there, um, I've often thought about, like, so think about neurons in your neural network or think about boosting stages in your gradient boosting classifier. Why am I spending three boosting rounds trying to catch all Apple when one signature can do it all? Right, so I've thought about that, and I think I think a lot of um, a lot of uh, mature companies. That's why they have both signatures and machine learning as a heuristic. Sometimes you just want to get the easy ones right away and let the machine learning focus on the hard ones. So I, I like that that suggestion. I, I would agree with that, John. Uh, yep. Uh, so you talk about uh, the brittleness of the signature still sticking around um, using the en um, engrams. So in NLP, uh, skip engrams. Um, can be used to solve some of that brittleness for that sort of problem. Have you had a look at that sort of thing? So yeah, it didn't look in depth. So I, I feel like um, there are multiple ways to use this. We're so we actually in the paper explored two approaches. One is purely signature based, and one is as an ingram in a in a model, right? So what I presented today was all the signature side, but the the model side definitely. Definitely, uh, they're much more robust, right? Uh, yeah, but at the fundamentally at the n-gram level, instead of say the quick brown fox jumped over, um, the fox over, so a one skip, oh, one, six gram. Oh yeah, we we didn't. Um, so what one thing about malware is um, it's uh, pos positionally insensitive. So my dot text section could could um, be at four hundred hex offset or somewhere else. So one thing we did, we, we did not, we never did any temporal downsampling in our set, but what we did do is, um, let me show you this. Here's a, here are the most common 32 grams. And you know something wrong about them, right? Um, it's, it's, it's massively redundant. And so this speaks to that. Instead of, in, instead of uh, like the naive thing to do here is like, I'm gonna skip every third byte uh, and reduce my set. But, you are in danger because of the positional insensitivity of missing out on something good. So instead we have this thing called a, a hash stride. 
So if the hash modulo some hash stride number, say 16, is equal to zero, I'm going to ignore, ignore the number. So that, that's a way to get around the, the um, um, sort of over-representing a, a single string. I guess I have not thought about how that helps the, the brittleness of, of the ingram. And then one last question here. Um, just real quick, first, uh, what hash function did you use? Um, in all of our experiments, we do use a ribbon carp uh, streaming hash. All that means mm -hmm. is that, say I've got a, a eight bytes coming in, um, I can put it through a shift register. So I, um, you multiply every position by a number, and, and when one comes out of the circle, circle buffer, I know what to subtract from it and what to add. Sure. So it's uh, very fast. So I, every hash costs one multiply addition. Yeah, I, I'm not super familiar with that, but is there any reason you didn't use any kind of locality-sensitive hash functions or? Um... Yeah, well, exactly. We, um, um, we don't want, look, we, we want a strict hash function, right? We, we want to minimize the number of collisions. Um, so things that are close to each other, we, we don't want in the same bin. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, let's give another round of applause.